Hello and welcome to the Debating Toastcast, a podcast about all things debating, from the Debate Toastmasters Club, 104 London Debaters. Today we are going to talk about a speech that was made at the Oxford Union in a debate on has woke culture gone too far. The speech was made by a comedian and social commentator called uh, Constantine Kizen, and he um, did a speech that I think is very interesting in terms of the elements that he uses in it. It has gone viral, as they say, not because it caught any nasty bugs, as far as I know, but because lots and lots of people, thousands of people, have uh, liked it and shared it and sent it around on social media. And it's sometimes sometimes interesting to look at these uh, sorts of uh, speeches that, or, or any contribution, really, that suddenly spreads like wildfire on social media and say, do they really merit uh, the attention they get? Uh, or perhaps some bits of them do and others don't. And I want to look at this speech for that reason, but also because I do think that we can learn something from it. At Toastmasters, we favor very much giving feedback and having evaluations given at the meetings of speeches. And in our case, obviously being a debate club, 104 London debaters, we evaluate debates. And we say uh, at the end of the debate, what worked well, what could have worked better, what can we learn for future debates, etc. And that's basically what I want to do here. I'm going to give Mr. Constantine Kissin a proper Toastmasters debate evaluation. So here we go. You will not know this, but I was supposed to be the first non-student speaker for the proposition. I've now been the fourth, which means that I now have to thank all the previous speakers for making my best points for me. Uh, and I find that the reason, the main reason now that I have left to be uh, in support of the motion is that I am so tired of talking about woke culture. That's why it's gone too far more than anything else. And I thank the other speakers for making the points for me because it means I don't have to reiterate the point that no, no, free speech is not some right wing reframing of whatever. It's the foundation of Western civilization upon this civilization is built and the enlightenment values that led to it. I don't have to make the point that has been made by far better people in the past that the only way to deal with the problem of racism is to treat people on the content of their character and nothing else. And the fact that woke culture seeks to overturn that is a new form of racism that we must all oppose. It means also, I will not use this opportunity to say I told you so, as someone who spent the last five years warning people in the West, that if we continue to erode our culture, if we continue to undermine our confidence in Western values, that our enemies, enemies like Vladimir Putin will seek to capitalize on it. I will not make any of those points tonight at all. Right. So here he uh, starts, of course, with a bit of a humorous opening, um, which uh, one might expect from, uh, you know, a comedian. It is a good idea to do because you soften your audience a little bit. And when they chuckle and smile, um, they are sort of more favorably conditioned, I suppose, towards or favorably uh, tuned to, to what you are about to to say and may be more open for your um, to your um, message. Now, what he then goes on to do is what we might call a bit of a rhetorical trick, if I uh, may use that term. Uh, it is called in the Greek. Well, I, I'm not saying this is the correct Greek pronunciation, by the way, uh, but this is um, how I've heard it said. Apophasis. Apophasis. A-P-O-F-H-A-S-I-S. If you want it, um, if you want to spell it, <laughs> we'll uh, put links to these terms in the comment section anyway. Apophasis basically means to say something by denying that you are saying it, or basically mentioning by denial is the short, short form. And another example of it might be that someone says, I am not going to mention that my opponent once hijacked a car and crashed it, because that would be completely irrelevant to this debate. By saying that you are not going to say it and then go on to say it, you are drawing attention to it in a in a bit of a sly way. Now it can be used with uh, tongue in, in a sort of tongue in cheek way, which which makes it uh, 
quite a, a nice way to draw attention to something that you think is important to highlight. However, you won't be spending your speech focusing on that, but you wanted to just make everybody aware of it. Um, and that's basically what Mr. Kizin is doing here. He is making sure that he reminds the audience about these important points, but also saying that, um, well, my speech will not be focusing on that. So he's, he's saying, you know, I won't say that. And then he says it, and we all know what he means, that he's not going to focus on it. So I think I think he pulls it off uh, here, this little trick, and it works reasonably well. But let's go on now to say, to what he is actually going to say. Instead, I'm not going to talk to those of you who already agree with me, which I imagine is most of you. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to talk to you because I imagine after everything you've heard tonight, you're going to vote for the proposition. I'm going to confess I will take your vote for granted. Tonight, I am the Labour Party and you are the Red Wall. Now, I want to talk to those of you who are woke and who are open to rational argument. A small minority, I accept. Because one of the tenets of wokeness is, of course, that your feelings matter more than the truth. But I believe in you. I believe there are those of you here who are woke, who are open to rational arguments. So let me make one. We are told that your generation cares more than any other about one issue in particular, and that issue is climate change. We're told that many of you suffer from climate anxiety. You wish to save the planet. And for tonight, and tonight only, I will join you. I will join you in worshipping at the feet of St. Greta of climate change. Let us all accept right here, right now, that we are living through a climate emergency and our stocks of polar bears are running extremely low. I join you in this view. I truly do. Now, what are we to do about this huge problem facing humanity? Right. So here he also does sort of two things within this uh, the clip we just heard. The first thing is that he sets out his target audience and... It is important that in debating, you are not your target audience is actually not your opponent. You are not trying to convince your opponent. You are trying to convince whoever the decision makers are. That may be judges in a formal debate competition, or in most cases, certainly at 104 London debaters, it will be the audience. They are going to be voting at the end of the debate. And so they are the people you are wanting to to um, have as your target audience. They are the people you need to convince. And, and Kizin is here saying that, OK, look, I am now talking to that little tiny majority that's left on the other side. Uh, and he is saying at the same time that the problem with wokeness is that one of the basic tenets of it's te of wokeness is that you're guided by feelings. Yet he's saying that I want to make a rational argument. So so hopefully that will convince those of you who are still open to rational arguments. OK, so let, we'll come back to that later. Then he goes on to do something which, in technical debating term, is called stasis. Stasis, S-T-A-S-I-S, -S, uh, me basically means where things stand still. So this is where things stand before you start debating. Uh, another example uh, could be uh, then, you know, from he says that this is that we all agree about climate change is a problem. OK, and then he says, what are we going to do about it? So. So what he's saying is the stasis is we agree on the problem. So let's say a debate was about tax levels. So one would say, I want it to be 35%. Another guy says 45%. But they agree that we do need to collect enough taxes to finance a certain level of public services. That would be the stasis. That's where we start. That's the place where we start out. And then the disagreement is how high does that level need to be or ought to be uh, in order to collect the taxes we need. So here he, he sets out the audience, who he wants to convince, and he sets out the stasis, i.e. what this debate is not about. We are going to agree on climate change and all that sort of stuff. It's a problem. What are we going to do about it? That's the question he has just posed. So let's hear now what he has to say about that. What can we in Britain do? We can only do one thing. You know why? This country is responsible for 2% of global carbon emissions, which means that if Britain was to sink into the sea right now, it would make absolutely no difference to the issue of climate change. You know why? Because the future of the climate is going to be decided in Asia and in Latin America by poor people who couldn't give a shit about saving the planet. 
I think there are two points of, of fact that I would like to point out that where I feel that this bit of his speech could have been perhaps more powerful because he makes a very strong rhetorical point here again. He's very good on rhetoric, isn't he? Um, and he says that uh, the poor people in the world, they couldn't give a shit about climate change. Well, colourful language, first of all. You need to be careful in the young audience like this. That probably works. It, perhaps it wouldn't work so well if, if uh, the average age was, was higher. But his basic point is that poor people don't care about that. They have more important priorities. Now, that perhaps is true, but he doesn't offer any uh, evidence to support it. And he had just said that I want to make a rational argument as opposed to the uh, emotional uh, argument that is uh, dominant on, uh, within the woke culture. So, uh, and, and I actually had to check up uh, this to see if, if if I could find any any grounds on which you could base such a claim. And uh, indeed, there was um, in, was it 2019? Yes, 2019, the UN did a survey where uh, about 9.7 million people worldwide were asked uh, to prioritize 16 different areas uh, according to importance. Um, and they were things like education, work, uh, healthcare, uh, sanitation, water, et cetera, et cetera, and climate. What action on climate change was one of them. Out of these 16 items, action on climate change came number 16, the very last. Okay, so that is actually something that he could have used to support such a big, massive claim. It would have made it much more uh, convincing, I think. Of course, can he speak for all poor people in the world? Of course he can't, and, and we all know that. Um, the other thing, he, he talks about the 2% that Britain emits. That's, that is factually correct, technically. However, um, a lot of that is because we import things produced in other parts of the world. Uh, so the emission is, as it were, exported. So, you know, we produce tons of stuff in China. And then instead of em emitting that uh, CO2 here by producing it here, we just import the, that, that stuff into our country. So if you were to include all of that, then ob obviously it would have been uh, it would have been more. And if, if Britain were to sink in the sea, then Britain wouldn't have bought those um, items from from abroad. And thus, the overall CO2 emissions in the world would have increased, uh, decreased, sorry, decreased a lot more than 2%. So, uh, and of course, he doesn't address the issue of whether leadership by industrial nations is important because we led the way to uh, the high carbon uh, economy. Perhaps we should lead the way out of it. That's also, the, you know, he doesn't address that issue. So so that's another another point there. Um, OK, we go on to the next point he makes. It's going to be decided by poor people in Asia and Latin America who don't care about saving the planet. You know why? Because they're poor. Because they're poor. I come from Russia, which is not a poor country. It's a middle income country. 20 percent of households in Russia do not have an indoor toilet. What they have is an outdoor toilet. And I don't mean one of those nice port that we get here. I don't even mean a Glastonbury port -a I mean a wooden shack with a hole in the ground that holds a collected fermented memory of the last 10,000 visits. <laughs> How many of you are going to go home tonight and say, let's rip out our bathroom and erect a Siberian shithouse in the back garden? And if you're not, why should they? 120 million people in China do not have enough food. I don't mean that they don't get dessert. I mean they suffer from malnutrition. That means that the immune system is breaking down because they don't have enough food. You're not going to get them to stay poor. Imagine you're Xi Jinping, the leader of China. When you were 10 years old, there was a revolution, a cultural revolution in your country. And people came and they... Put your father in prison. Your mother had to denounce him. Your sister killed herself. And you, no longer enjoying the protection of your formerly powerful father, were sent to a village where you lived in a cave house. And here you are, decades later, you have clawed your way up the bloody and greasy pole of Chinese politics to be the undisputed supreme leader of the very communist party that destroyed your family. And you know that the main thing you have to do to survive and to stay in power is to deliver the one thing that the people of China want, prosperity, economic growth. 
Where do you think climate change ranks on Xi Jinping's list of priorities? A third of all children who live in extreme poverty in the world live in India. That means they are starving. Right, we're going to stop there for a moment because here what he has done is used, again, some rhetorical uh, devices. One is the personal anecdote and the second is the rhetorical question. Now, personal anecdote can be powerful in a debate because it personalizes the point you're trying to make. You may be wanting to make a complicated technical uh, uh, point about why we should do something uh, or, or why something is necessary to do. Uh, and you can give all the stats and numbers and figures in the world, which most of the time, you know, people will listen to and then forget the exact figures. Uh, you may give them a notion of the magnitude of the problem, but if you tell them a story about Aunt Jane who went through such and such and this is horrible and we should change uh, this uh, system, whatever it is. Then it brings the, the, the point alive. And and that's what he does here. It talks about the uh, Russian uh, outdoor toilet. And then he uses the rhetorical question, would you like to exchange your nice Western toilet with a Siberian shithouse? No, if if you don't, why should they? Now, of course, in that there is a supposition. There's a there's a uh, an unstated premise in his statement, which actually touches upon a fallacy of the straw man, the straw man fallacy, which is where you uh, create a position for your opponent, which he or she may never actually have expressed, and then you say whatever is this thing that you have said. That's wrong. And then they didn't actually say that. OK, so here he's saying that if you are woke, then you are saying that we must get rid of our toilets and have uh, Russian, you know, outdoor toilets. Now, those who are woke and those and, and trying to sort of save the world may not actually think that. Somehow there is a lack of connection being made by Kissin in in, term, in in the sense of what wokeness is. And why that means we must all have Siberian outdoor toilets. That connection has not been uh, has not been established. So, so there's a lack in the warrant, as we call it, the the connection between uh, the, the the argument uh, and the conclusion. So, so so where is that link? I didn't quite understand where that where that link is. And then he he repeats uh, the process by telling the story of uh, Xi Jinping, um, and then says, you know, why his uh, priority will not be climate change is his essential point here with a rhetorical point. What do you think is his uh, is his you know where do you think it will r r range in his line of uh, priorities? It's not going to be very high. Basically, this is the point he's trying to make. Um, again, he may very well be right, you know. So, but he is making. Uh, a claim, an assumption, and then illustrating that with anecdote, which can be powerful. But if you simply argue from anecdote without also giving the factual facts and figures to back it up, uh, then that can become a fallacy as well, because you are just telling a story, but you are not actually making a convincing argument with, with uh, facts and figures and backing up the link between those stories you are telling and the conclusion that you want your audience to make together with you. Now he's going to start to make his conclusion, actually. So let's listen to the, the last bit. And dying of preventable disease. Now, about 15 months ago, my wife got pregnant. Not me, because we're old school. <laughs> and for nine months, we talked about what our boy would look like. What he might do when he grows up. We looked at baby scans and videos on YouTube about what the fetus looks like at nine months and 12 months and 20 months. And eventually he was born. And he is this cute little bundle of joy. He's cuter than about 80% of puppies. Right? Now, if you said to me that I had a choice, either my son had a serious risk of starving or dying from a preventable disease in the next year, or I could press a button and he would live. He would go to school. He would bring his first girlfriend home. He'd go to university and graduate and become a woke idiot. <laughs> and then he'd get a job and get married and have children and become a man. But all I have to do 
is press this button. And for every day of my son's life, a giant plume of CO2 is going to re get released into the atmosphere. And you're all very young, and most of you are not parents. Let me tell you something. There is not a parent in the world who would not smash that button so hard their hand bled. You are not going to get these people to stay poor. You're not even going to get them to not want to be richer. And so I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, there is only one thing we can do in this country to stop climate change. And that is to make scientific and technological breakthroughs that will create the clean energy that is not only clean, but also cheap. And the no, thank you. And the only, I, I want everyone to get home on time today, which is not going to happen. And the only thing that wokeness has to offer in exchange is to brainwash bright young minds like you to believe that you are victims, to believe that you have no agency, to believe that what you must do to improve the world is to complain, is to protest, is to throw soup on paintings. And we on this side of the house are not on this side of the house because we do not wish to improve the world. We sit on this side of the house because we know that the way to improve the world is to work, is to create, it is to build. And the problem with woke culture is that it's trained too many young minds like yours to forget about that. Thank you very much. So what he does here uh, to be technical again, is that he attacks the solvency of the uh, of the what what he calls the woke side of the of the argument. Now, the solvency basically means the solution that you put forward. So, when you put forward a, a proposition, for example, you say we want to do X because such and such, and then the other side can then directly attack that solvency and say, yeah, what well, what well, even if we do that, it will not solve the problem. And that's essentially what he's saying here. So he's, he's again, using a personal anecdote, very powerful, I think, with the example of his baby being born and that parents anywhere, you know, even if it meant emitting a plume of CO2, uh, you know, we would willingly do so because we just want the best for our, our children, you know. And as a parent myself, I, I do find that quite a powerful point. Uh, I'm not sure if young people who are not parents finds it equally find it equally um, convincing. And again, I'm sure there are parents somewhere in the world who may uh, resist pushing that button. I don't know. You know, that's that's uh, again, it's difficult to talk for everybody. But as a rhetorical point, I think it works quite well, too, because it enables particularly young people, uh, as is the, the target audience here, to get a little bit of a different perspective, to understand that actually people do see these things in a slightly different perspective when they are desperate to improve their lives. And I think that's important. But And then what it goes on to say, though, is that you know, we don't disagree with the fact that the problem is there and that it needs a solution. But we, but he says, wokeness, basically, uh, only the only thing wokeness does is to is to focus on sort of complaining and whinging and and breaking down the stuff that exists already and throwing uh, soup on paintings, etc. Of course, again, he's making a, a big assumption, uh, painting a bit of a straw man there. You know, why can't woke people also be in favor of technology? You know, you, I'm sure you can be woke and be in favor of using technological solutions where that's relevant. I mean, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's possible. At least it, it's something that can be argued. Right. So so I think that the, the, the point, therefore, in terms of addressing the motion, woke culture has gone too far, loses actually quite a bit of power if this were an actual debate. Uh, I mean, an actual formal debate. It is, of course, a debate. But if it were, if it were an, a debate at one or four London debaters, the point that we would have picked up in his speech is that he hasn't actually addressed the, the motion because what he's saying is world culture has gone too far, but then he is making assumptions about world culture that may not be true and saying that that's why that won't work because it's a b and c but is it really that you know is that a truthful um uh, depiction and an accurate depiction of woke culture perhaps it is perhaps it isn't perhaps rather what he's talking about is certain people who are exaggerating who are um, overdoing it and who are uh, sort of uh, engaging themselves in 
acts of uh, exhibitionism, uh, you know, which, which may or may not be an integral part of work culture. But again, you know, that we are back to the definitional debate here. You know, what is the definition of work? What does it actually mean? And Kizan is sort of making, as I said, he is creating this, this straw man of workness and then he attacks that. Um, and that, I think, reduces somewhat the, 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 the overall convincing power of his of his speech. But essentially uh, what he's doing in debating terms as well, uh, as I said, is that he attacks the solvency. So he attacks the, the he says that um, that woke culture with its you know, too great focus on complaining about uh, past injustices, for example, um, means that people forget about looking at um, uh, at some practical, uh, technical solutions, etc., and therefore it won't work. So, and I think actually that's a point that he could have developed a lot more. He could have talked about it a bit more. It would have made this speech address the motion, I think, in a more powerful way. Um, but as a piece of rhetorical flourish i think this speech is a great example but be careful about those fallacies be careful about those assumptions be careful of jumping to certain conclusions with, without taking the audience with you by supporting your points uh, and your premises with with warrants with grounds in facts and statistics as well as telling those compelling stories so there we are that was my analysis and it's just my personal take let me emphasize that on Constantine Kissin's uh, contribution to the debate at the Oxford Union. Finally, I just want to finish with a quote by the great cognitive psychologist Steven Pinker. And he writes in his book, Rationality, which I recommend to all debaters actually, and to all non-debaters for that matter, the following. We evolved not as intuitive scientists, but as intuitive lawyers. While people often try to get away with lame arguments for their own positions, they are quick to spot fallacies in other people's arguments. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why debating is so important. Because you don't get away with lame arguments. Someone will find you out. You've been listening to The Debating Toastcast. Feel free to leave a comment, critical or encouraging. We welcome both. And if you'd like more information about joining the club or coming first as a guest, please have a look at our website, 104londondebaters.club or send us an email on info at 104londondebaters.club That's info at 104londondebaters.club Thank you for listening.